This seminar is part of the AHEAD Capacity Building Program to promote accessible heritage experiences in the cultural sector. So we are going to be together here um, for both our presentations, but uh, I will be talking first in this uh, first part of the presentation, and then I will give the floor to Macarena after uh, the, the break and that um, peer session, right? So um, what we want to share with you today is uh, a, a brief introduction into the approach of audience development. And to do that, and, and not to jump directly into some sort of definitions or something like that, which is sometimes a little bit cold, let's say, uh, we would like to give you some context that, in our view, is relevant for understanding what we mean by um, audience development. Um, and hence, in that first point, I will be delving into that controversy between the, the, the both concepts of democratization of culture and cultural democracy. Then I will give a, a very brief um, definition and introduction of the concept itself of audience development. Uh, then we will have the, the peer uh, session and the break. And after that, Macarena will uh, explain those eight strategic areas of intervention in, in audience development that are a result of our line of research in the previous years. Right? So then let us start with, um, with an image, right? An image of a man, uh, well, a very elegant man, I should say, right? Um, dancing uh, on a floor full of images, of, of photos, right? Um, this is a very significant image, in my view, uh, to really grasp the sense uh, of that concept of democratization of culture. Uh, this is not any man, it's a very particular and very relevant figure uh, in uh, cultural policies, we can say, and also cultural management more broadly. Uh, in Europe in the uh, second half of the 20th century. He is André Malraux, right? He was the first Minister of Cultural Affairs. In, he was appointed by Gerald de Gaulle in France in 1958 as the first Minister of Culture. Uh, if I'm not wrong, he was actually the first Minister of Culture in, in France ever, but also in any country ever. Or he was the, the first man to really hold that office and hence to really be able to orientate and, and, and guide the cultural policies of a whole country, right, during, during some years. Right? He was really a, a, a very special man. He was a, a, a novelist, a writer. Uh, he was very, very much embedded in the intellectual and artistic circles of Paris between the two wars. Uh, he also traveled a lot. He was kind of an adventurer. He, he went to Indochina and, and had a lot of adventures there, right? He was imprisoned. Well, uh, his life is, is really uh, a very passionate thing. And he was throughout his life as, as a writer, as a cultural theorist, and as a politician. Um, he was passionate about culture. And he was, I must say, he was... Uh, passionate about culture in a very French manner, if, if I can say that. We, what we are seeing here, what we are watching in this image uh, while he dances, right, is uh, one of the big projects of his life, what he called Le Musée Imaginaire, the, the imaginary museum. Um, the whole idea of that imaginary museum was to take benefit from the latest uh, advances in technology at the time. In, 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 at that time, it was basically photo photography uh, and uh, use that to really bring culture to everyone, bring culture and cultural heritage and art, generally speaking, to everyone. So the idea was to take high quality photos of, uh, of uh, different cultural artifacts and uh, artistic objects throughout French public collections 
and edit them in, in, a, in a volume so that everyone could really access that imaginary museum, which was encompassing actually the whole country, the whole France. The whole idea, I am, I am bringing this image here because I think it's very symptomatic and very telling of what the ideal behind that term of democratization of culture is. It is all about bringing culture to the people. Culture that has traditionally, I mean, historically in the long run, if you look at it, has many times very often been a product of of the little, of, of, of a small group of people, of a small and privileged group of people, of aristocracy, of monarchy, of the church, and really now in democratic regimes, go and open it to everyone, to the citizenship, for them to, to benefit from that. That is what I am, is, uh, why I'm telling you that it is a very French approach, because of course, uh, the ideals of the French Revolution and, and even the institution itself of the Louvre Museum, which was the, the, the template and the ideal for the institution of the modern museum uh, in any other country, right, uh, are behind that idea. So to take something that was close and, and, and only uh, pertaining to, to, to a very close circle of people and really open it to everyone uh, to enjoy. So mm, that is the, the idea of really spreading, reaching out to everyone uh, and um, has uh, some implications. The first implication would be that I, I'm meaning the, the, the cultural manager or the cultural politician also, right? I know what is worth spreading. I know what cultural value is and, and hence uh, I can promote some flagship institutions like national ballets, national libraries, national theaters, these kind of things, right? Uh, and really open them to the people, right? And, and the second thing is that uh, I also know that it's good for them. It's good for everyone to participate and to uh, get inspired and enriched by culture, right? They, that would elevate people and, and, well, make them better in a sense. So I think that 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 image is summarizing quite a lot about that idea of democratization of culture. Let's jump into the next um, uh, concept, which is cultural democracy. Well, after some years or, or even some decades, uh, when uh, after the perhaps since the fifties, fifties and sixties, right that idea of democratization of culture was really orientating cultural policies in many countries, spreading out from France. A number of criticisms to that idea and that first approach started appearing. In some way, we can say that it is still a very elitist idea. Uh, of course, you are taking something that was closed and opening it to everyone, but in the end, it's like always the same usual suspects that end up consuming that sort of culture. So if you look at the audiences, and that's a very recurring problem, right? If you look at the audiences that are attending national ballets or national operas and these kind of flagship institutions all throughout Europe, right? You will always end up looking at the same type of people, right? People that can really pay for, for the entrance and that have also a social, uh, economic and educational level that allows them to enjoy fully what they are, say, uh, watching. So in that sense, it is still elitist. And, and it is also narrow in the sense that um, there is always a, a, a very closed set of things that are considered worth spreading, right? Like, like I was saying, like the, the type of cultural manifestations that we consider high culture, right? Like ballet, opera, and, and these kind of things. Um, opposing that, we have the idea of cultural democracy uh, since the 70s, the 80s, right? Um, and starting, uh, well, also with the movements around uh, 1968, right? where the idea was that more people should have a say in defining what actually culture is. Not only 
the, I know the, the, the leaders of cultural policies, but many more people should have a say, right? And also more people should be creating culture by themselves, right? So we need to not really keep constructing, keep building those flagship institutions, but rather decentralize culture and, and have community art centers in neighborhoods and have small uh, public libraries and have uh, groups of, of amateur theater and all these kind of things. So we need to really uh, make it a vibrant uh, arena and scene where everyone can get involved and, and create culture themselves. So not just watch at what others are doing, but also uh, express themselves in cultural ways, right? So, um, in a sense, what we are uh, suggesting is that uh, there is a problem with both approaches, right? So I, I don't think we need to um, uh, select one of those approaches and stick to it, right? Because both things uh, make sense uh, in a way, right? But in my understanding, both, thing, both approaches are limited, at least in one sense. Both understand audiences, cultural audiences, as being passive, as being mainly passive, right? So in the approach of democratization of culture, uh, it's basically, well, I, I am telling you what culture is, which is high culture, what the, the tradition of high culture is, and you just go and listen. You, yeah, you, you just go and watch, right, what I tell you. In cultural democracy, finally, they agree that that is why they want all people not to be audiences, but rather to, to become cultural producers, right? And to make art themselves, to make culture themselves. Because from that approach to just listen or to just watch, right? That is something passive and it, it, it's not something they want to promote. In our understanding, I think that the, the richness of culture of um, audience development is that it is at the heart of that approach is the idea that there is a type of activity of audiences as such. As being an audience is something active, right? If you take it seriously, seriously enough, let's say. Right? Um, it is the audience that, that plays with your contents and makes them alive in a sense, right? Without that participation, that interaction, any museum, any concert hall, any opera house would be void and meaningless, right? It's only your audience that activate what you are uh, offering. Right? So of course, there are some risks also and some dangers in any activation of audiences, right? So. Uh, you have to be careful with how you activate your audience because here, for instance, we can see an example of audience activation. We have a very active audience, right? Um, but probably with its, with its own risks, right? So I guess the question here, the question behind the type of understanding uh, I think we share uh, of cultural uh, audience development is rather how can we um, how can we make sense of our relationship to audiences? Uh, how can we make sense of that? How can we promote, let's say, an active audience, but um, in a meaningful and, and durable way, right? Um, I, 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 me as a philosopher, when I'm with a philosophy background, I, I cannot help but thinking of something that uh, Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher, used to uh, to tell, he he very often reflected on the on the idea that what really is pushing us to make us uh, ask ourselves the question of what is the meaning of life, what makes sense uh, of of our life, is the fact that we are all going to die at some point, right? So it is the the the, the fear towards death the awareness of death as, as the limit of our own existence that is pushing us into that question of the meaning of life, right? I think we can take that reflection uh, to the cultural role and, and think of what death could mean for a cultural institution. Of course, we, we can always think of the budget, right? But 
in the, uh, ultimately, I think that death for a cultural institution is the lack of relevance. I mean, you can have a very healthy budget, but if you are not relevant to anyone, then you are dead. Uh, and in, in the face of that fear of that limit, right, to the existence itself of cultural institutions, uh, the question of how we can look for relevance uh, and embed that uh, search for relevance in our mission makes a lot of sense. And I think we can only do that by having a meaningful uh, and rich interconnection with our audience. So that is why we are suggesting that concept of audience development as some sort of taking perhaps some ideas of cultural democracy and democratization of culture, but also going be beyond that controversy uh, towards uh, the search for uh, relevance through the interaction with the audience and, and through the construction of a meaningful relationship with audiences. Right. So, okay. Perhaps um, some of the of the things that uh, I, I was exactly now um, re referring or introducing that debate, uh, what we actually mean by audience, we can use also many other um, words, uh, readers, viewers, spectators, members, users, right? Um, and and also development, right? Uh, reach reach out really and also uh, engage, like right? make them uh, get engaged uh, in, in, in your offer. Right? Well, we, we promised an official definition, here it is, right? This is what the European Commission says that audience development is. Audience development is a strategic, dynamic, and interactive process of making the arts widely accessible. It aims at engaging individuals and communities in experiencing, enjoying, participating in, and valuing the arts through various means available today for cultural operators, from digital tools to volunteering, from co-creation to partnerships. Well, it is a very wide uh, definition, and uh, that is why we like it, actually, because it, it leaves a lot of space, really, to, to make different things and call them audience development, which is, in fact, what, what uh, ends up happening, right? Uh, there are several different approaches and in the end almost uh, any organization has has to look for their own way into into making it real right yeah maybe if i may just to uh, a small uh, idea and i think that uh, from this definition uh, it's important the idea well we have like put some uh, well, words a little bit bigger uh, and we feel it's uh, interesting from this definition that the commission um, well uh, defends that it should be a strategic process no that's something that needs time it's something that uh, the organization well, we'll work for it uh, in the long term and that sometimes it's very difficult to have sure, like uh, immediate results, like very quick. Okay, we want to develop audiences, we, can, we want to get like more people in and that's it. And, and that's not the approach, no, that we need something more profound, that we need something, uh, well, that uh, needs uh, to consider a longer term horizon no and the other idea that i think it's also important is this idea that it's dynamic and that it needs to be flexible it needs to well flexible uh, in the different contexts and and i think that something that we have taken out from different projects and working in different contexts environments geographies with different people and so on and in different like subsectors so probably it's not the same being a gallery or a museum or a dance company or something like that and uh, we well we have uh, we have I don't understand that there are no recipes and that some uh, well strategies uh, actions or activities that might work for uh, in a different con in one context might not work in a in a different one yeah so even though we might be here archaeological sites and we might think oh this is a very good idea and this might work in Altamira maybe that idea will not work in Ostia Antica and I think that's that's important yeah um yeah. 
and then maybe we can go with the objectives. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, these three objectives are, are the three more usual goals that usually cultural institutions uh, aim at when when they engage in a, in a process of audience development. Uh, well, the first one, it's, it's actually the, the first one that pops up to, to the mind of everyone, like in really increasing audiences. And this is only one of the possibilities. Another one would be also deepening that relationship and enriching that relationship with your current, your current actual audiences, right? And then also diversifying audiences, not, not necessarily bringing more people that are already similar to the ones you have, right? But also bringing more people that are different, right? From different groups, different collectives. Okay, so um, we are perhaps running uh, out of time, but uh, we just wanted to uh, share with you that we understand uh, audience development as being, let's say, an, an, an umbrella concept that is uh, combining different traditions, uh, different lines of thought. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of cultural marketing in, in it, but there is also that aesthetic approach, that idea of the reception, right? The, the, the theory of the receiver that comes from the theory of art and aesthetics uh, that gives a lot of weight to the activity of, of, the, of the public, of the receiver uh, in, in any artistic process, right? And also a social approach, uh, a sociology of arts and of, of culture, right? Um, it, it's also that, that idea that there is a, a very strong strategical component in audience development that aims at really creating those um, meaningful relationships that I was uh, referring to previously, right? Really a stable and uh, long-term meaningful relationship with your audience. That is at least the, the ideal. And uh, perhaps we can end up with, with uh, the implications of that organizational, that strategical character of audience development, right? Uh, and that idea of really aiming at creating long-term meaningful relationships, right? It has uh, three main implications uh, in our understanding. First, of course, that uh, whenever we engage in a process of cultural audience development, we must consider a long-term horizon, right? So it's not about short-term actions that are trying to, to I don't know, uh, bring some people into your premises or something. It's really the long-term that you need to keep in mind because of that strategical dimension. Um, then it's also, well, transversal. It, it must really transcend the scope of a specific function or a specific department in your organization. Very often you can see that cultural organizations um, put the, the responsible for audiences and, and publics in different places. Sometimes it's education, sometimes it's communication, sometimes even security in some museums. So, um, and it's really, I, I mean, that is perhaps ignoring the fact, well, somewhere it must be, right? But um, it is perhaps ignoring the fact that it's something really transversal to the whole organization because that construction of a meaningful and long-term relationship with your audience must be at the heart of all functions and all activities of the organization, right? And, and hence, the third uh, thing would be that if that is the case, and if it's not only the function of a given department or, or, or a set of people, then it implies that everything must be aligned with that, with that uh, effort to achieve the, the, the construction of a solid and rich relationship with your audiences, which means organizational changes, right, necessarily. And, and that, that alignment and that ability to change is something that uh, organizations that are successful in, in uh, engaging in audience development really show that they can have, right? Okay. So, mm -hmm. okay, so that, that would be the end of our first presentation. And then, so we jump into that um, time slot for peer learning, right? Um, <clears throat> we, we have uh, basically two questions, right? Uh, one would be, what aspect of audience development is more relevant for you uh, after what we have been 
commenting, right? Uh, and the second one, it's like more narrowed down and, and, and landed into your organization. Uh, think of, of your organization and select some audience development experience or activity um, that has been a success or or on the contrary, it has been a failure, a small disaster, perhaps, right? And what are the key factors behind that success and that failure? Okay, so, well, uh, during this second part of, um, of this seminar, um, we we wanted to um, well delve a little bit uh, into um, what we call the eight main strategic areas of intervention in audience development. Yeah. Uh, well, this come this came out of a European project, which was uh, the Engage Audiences project, and there you have also the link. And I I think that well also the final pro uh, report and also many different documents that might be useful are, are there. But, um, well, what I liked from this project, this project had like different dimensions. What one dimension was, or so the main idea was to analyze some best practices to uh, in audience development in different countries. I think it, there were 28 countries involved and in each country, uh, a couple of experiences were selected, yeah? Um, so, for example, in Spain, it was uh, um, El Mercat de las Flores in, in Barcelona and uh, uh, in, in Tenerife, also the auditorium of Tenerife, and, well, and so like this in, in different countries. No? So the researchers, we were uh, interviewing some of the people there in the organization, and then after well, transcribing everything and analyzing everything, we tried to understand, well, what were like the common ideas that emerged from, from that analysis, yeah? And those common ideas were grouped in these eight uh, blocks um, that, well, were supposed, of course, to be something important uh, when well, trying to, um, well, learned a little bit uh, what audience development is, what uh, what type of audience development uh, initiatives uh, are being uh, carried out and what is important uh, from an organizational point of view. Yeah, um, these eight areas uh, that I will well um, present to you, uh, I hope in a brief manner, but at least might be of inspiration uh, for further uh, debate and also inspiration for our um, the initiatives and the projects that uh, we are going to think uh, about in the framework of uh, this AHEAD project. Yeah, The eight areas were programming, participation, the digital dimension uh, that probably uh, this is, of course, getting more and more important uh, over time. The use of data, place, alliances and collaborations, and then uh, two ideas that um, might be a little bit more umbrella. The idea of organizational change management that already Jaime was uh, introducing in the prior presentation and the idea of capacity building, yeah? So, um, uh, in the, thinking a little bit about programming, no? And uh, I think that we introduced this also uh, before. Um, sometimes um, audience development might be, uh, or people might think, okay, audience development, well, this is marketing, this is communication, or this is about education. And sometimes programming, uh, it's not sort of an area that might be involved. And what we found out in, during this project is that exactly programming is something really important because it's the core of uh, what the organization is doing and how it connects with the uh, with the audience, with the publics and the communities and so on. Yeah. And also, this is very much linked with the example that I was referring before about the High Art Museum in Atlanta. Yeah. So um, what I would like here to 
uh, highlight is that when we call up, when we talk about uh, programming, we always, or we usually think about what's the core product, yeah? So what's the essence, what we do, uh, like for example, an exhibition, it might be a performance, it might be, um, well, what uh, the the main uh, the main programming that uh, it's related to our mission to what we do, yeah. But that's not only programming. Of course, that's programming, and that's very uh, important. But we also uh, need to consider it in a more open uh, uh, approach uh, and consider it also what we call the enriched offer and also the collateral offer yeah that has also have an impact in the whole audience experience let's say yeah so what's enriched offer the enriched offer is that uh, programming that it's related to the core product because it tries to uh, well enrich <laughs> this offer it tries to uh, make it more accessible. Sometimes we uh, program or some uh, intros, some conferences, some talks. Sometimes we show uh, our audience um, the backstage. Um, we have uh, pamphlets or some sheets in our museums, so or we try to explain uh, what's the core product about. Yeah, so that's the enriched offer. And then we have uh, some offer that we call the collateral offer that, well, it has nothing to do with the core product, but it really affects also the experience, which might be related with, I don't know, the temperature of the museum, if the, we can park where the, where the um, uh, institution is located, if the uh, toilets are accessible, if we need to, um, I don't know, go through stairs or uh, things like this, no? If there's a cafe or things that might be very tangible, very <laughs> human uh, related, no? But uh, might also change the experience uh, totally, yeah? So probably you all know this painting, this is the Starry Night from Van Gogh and probably you would know that where it's located and if you think about uh, certain artworks and certain museums, I don't know, Las Meninas in El Prado or uh, La Gioconda in El Louvre or whatever, and well, yeah, we can locate that, no? but that's uh, those, uh, um, those very well-known artworks are well, very few compared with all what we have, what's the, what's the rest. And that's why uh, we need to think and, and also, uh, well, what uh, researchers have found out is that uh, when we consider and we separate uh, what's the frequent audience uh, and the occasional audience, I mean, for example, uh, you were referring now in Ostia Antica and in Altamira, uh, how many tourists you have, so those, well, is that those visitors that just come for once to our organization and uh, they will not come uh, more, no? Well, uh, sometimes, um, well, and, and maybe that's, uh, in that case, uh, it might not uh, it might not uh, be the uh, that I mean, it could be that those are frequent visitors to museums in general, no, and that might be uh, very knowledgeable about that, no. But what if we consider like uh, the difference between frequent audience and occasional audiences? What we see is that, of course. The frequent audience is very strongly determined by the core product, no? by the exhibition itself or by the performance or if you might, I don't know, be an uh, opera goer and you know exactly the cast, who's going to sing, whatever. They're like much more knowledgeable about that and you might be attracted by that. Whereas in the case of the occasional audience, uh, uh, this might be a little bit different. And in that case, uh, we need to consider very much the enriched offer and the collateral offer, because those uh, external layers might play a very important role uh, in the um, in the audience experience. Yeah, and uh, well, the audience experience um, we need to consider this uh, as well as a, as a process. No, considering that uh, the artistic exchange that here in the middle is, of course, the moment where we are visiting the the gallery or where we are watching the show, whatever. 
uh, but that's not only the uh, the artist the, the the experience the audience experience the audience experience goes beyond that and that's why when we, we need to consider this uh, previous part this previous part related to contextualization where also part of our uh, well uh, enriched offer might make sense and as well what's happening afterwards uh, related with uh, those activities that might uh, related to meaning make yeah um well this is just an example i will not uh, deepen very much on it uh, about uh, an organization that has uh, innovated or tried to innovate in different products in different formats of uh, the core product no sometimes it's very easy to uh, play with the collateral offer and then rich offer and sometimes it's a little bit more difficult in the organizations to negotiate changes in the core product. This is an example of an organization that did it. We have also uh, discussed in our previous deep uh, learning the idea of uh, small formats and so on. This is, uh, for example, uh, here we have the example of the mini concerts that were very cheap and they were, I don't know, uh, were programmed very like three mini concerts in one afternoon and you could just uh well uh from having an impulse and say okay i'm going to uh, enter the, the concert hall and 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 just uh, enjoy the the concert yeah Whereas here the journey were uh three hours the concerts for aficionados i mean Knowing the, uh, getting to know the needs of the different types of audiences and publics and trying to uh, do something specific for them. Yeah. Okay. So that was maybe the, the longest explanation for the first uh, box. And I'm trying to uh, go a little bit faster for the rest. Participation also um, was one of the um, factors that well, uh, or were, was yeah, that was common to uh, those uh, organizations that were analyzed. And I think here as well, when we ask you the question, what's audience development for you? Also, some people were thinking of participation. So this is something uh, interesting. And uh, the idea also here is that, well, the organization itself has to reflect on what's participation for um for its institution no for my museum for my archaeological site what do you do i understand under this word participation because it's a very broad um um way and we can understand as we can see and i'll come back a little bit but we have here uh, an example uh, of what it might uh, mean, the different spectrum. No, we can have a continuum here, and we can have, I know, these more uh, receptive um, uh, positions. No, where we have, or we are considering the um, the audience as, as spectators. No, and it's just us, the traditional institution, that we program something and we give it to you, and you just well consume it or uh, enjoy it or no, but you don't have anything to say there. Or if we walk towards a more participatory institution where of course here you see the, the different arrows that, well, it became, it become a, a dialogue and there are a different arrows in two different directions, yeah? Where we might, uh, well, walk towards co-creation or even like more uh, experimental approaches where uh, the audience themselves might become artists and so on. But uh, this is not necessary, like the being more participatory, it's better. Uh, that's not the case. So we need, what's important is that as an organization, we define and we understand uh, what is participation for us and what uh, up to what point uh, do we want or where do we want to be in this continuum, yeah? And uh, try to enable for, for whom, because uh, there might be also segments of the audience that might be more willing to participate more actively, whereas others might be willing to participate, uh, well, uh, in a more quiet manner, 
but uh, also uh, this might not uh, mean that they are not active. They are. They can be also uh, well active uh, in their minds uh, and being creative uh, themselves. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, Arinera in Zaragoza. This is a Spanish city, and it was an old industrial building that was uh, well uh, rebuilt to be in an industrial uh, cultural center uh, that was uh, managed by the community. And well, this is an example of one of the well extreme towards participation and and so on. No more related with cultural democracy that was Jaime also uh, explaining in the beginning. But it, this doesn't mean that all the institutions need to be arinera because of that, because that's not, of course, the purpose. So, so also this is very much related with the question of the mission of who we are, what and 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 what's our mission um, as an organization. Yeah. Then we have also uh, the digital dimension as an important dimension, uh, and probably, uh, well, this project uh, was carried out before the pandemic, so after the pandemic, the digital dimension was even more important with the social media, with the, uh, of course, now nowadays, if you cannot uh, probably sell your tickets uh, uh, throughout the mobile phones, so, so you, you will not be relevant for a large, um, well, amount of uh, young people, and uh, maybe not so young as well. Um, the digital dimension might be not only related to selling tickets, it's related also to participation. And as you will see, those boxes, even though they are boxes here, they are all of them very much connected. Yeah. So it's related to participation. It could be related to programming because nowadays, well, we can also walk through the collection of some museums where we can, well, mm, virtually uh, feel that maybe we are there and that we maybe will like to go physically uh, later in time and, and so on. So the digital dimension is also an important dimension that should be um, well considered. Uh, to be linked uh, to the physical, to the physical one. Yeah? And this is, a, I think, this is a trend that's not only happening in the cultural sector; it's happening everywhere, uh, where also the um, companies they they are um, well organizing and pl uh, planning their strategies that need to be omnichannel. You no, know? this idea of the omnichannel is something that. Uh, you need to reach your client in, in, in that sense of business, no? Uh, in the shop, but also in the digital world, and you need to be coherent. And sometimes this is not so easy to do. So you need to also devote some uh, resources there. Yeah. Um, I like very much this example of the Brooklyn Museum with the their app Ask. I don't know if you know it, is that uh, they designed an app so that if when you go through the museum and, and you can directly use the app to ask your questions, wherever the question you might have, to some experts that are uh, like in a call center or something like this, answering your questions through the, the app. And this was a very successful project that, well, uh, um, enabled to um, connect um, with the, well, with, with their audience and create more engagement, yeah. Then um, we have, this is also very much linked to the use of data because sometimes lots of data come from the digital part, from our information systems and so on. And here the idea was, well, we are thinking of engaging with our audiences, we need to know our audiences and we need to, uh, well, to try to get some evidence, some, some pieces of evidence and so, it's okay, let's collect data, but um, in order to take decisions. And that's the important thing. So we don't want to collect data just for the sake of it. We don't want to have service just for the, because we want to know more. No, the idea is that we want really to act on that data analysis. We want to take decisions. And this was an important characteristic of those um, uh, cultural organizations that well, were uh, considered as uh, best practices uh, for, for that in that project, yeah. And 
another dimension uh, is place. Sometimes we play with place because sometimes place might be a barrier itself. Um, sometimes museums or theaters might be considered as temples and some a part of the audience might not feel invited or might feel a little bit terrified to just go into because they feel they don't belong there. And uh, if that's the case uh, with the type of audience that we want to connect, then a good uh, or some initiatives that were successful um, were to use some alternative places yeah and you have here two different uh, examples they are not from the well heritage um, uh, se sector or from the museum they are more from the performing arts sector but i think that sometimes we can also be inspired by uh, uh, some other cultural institutions that might be very much uh, different from us no and here for example opera up close uh, this was a little opera company uh, in the uk they were programming opera in the pubs you know that in the uk they they used to go to the pubs and and the, this was also a very small format um well production and they were really really successful they also um, play the um, they were adapting of course the works and they were playing in English for example and a play a pie and a pint is in Glasgow and they were also um, doing small format and very short uh, performances uh, during the lunchtime so that people could go for break uh, in a normal uh, day have the break have some something to eat at the same time they were having um, they were watching uh, a theater before us, yeah? Okay, um, another important idea is that cultural organizations are small, usually with scarce resources, and that's why it's so important to uh, think of alliances, of collaborations, especially if we're thinking of audience development. Because sometimes we, and here I put the example here, Kinsler House, I, it, that was um, an organization in Vienna that I was interviewing. And what I found out from them is that they were very honest and say, okay we really want to diversify our audiences but uh, sometimes we don't have uh, the tools we don't have the language uh, and we feel very insecure to communicate and to uh, approach those new audiences because we are so different so we need to look for uh, someone who really works with them with those local communities that can be a sort of ambassador and for me, that was, well, really inspiring. Okay, and finally, well, uh, and this is not new because I think Jaime was already uh, introducing this and this was also uh, in the, well, definition uh, ideas, no, that we were mentioning. Uh, adopting an audience-centered approach sometimes involves changing the, the way we work in the organization. And it might mean changing our culture, our organizational culture, our mindset. Sometimes it means that we need to start working more together, like the people from programming, education, communication, security, whatever. And we need to, well, create new meetings, new coordination mechanisms to start talk, talking and working together in a different way. And sometimes it might be, I don't know, thinking of new functions or uh, hiring new people, I don't know. But it does not, this is perhaps, it does not need to be like that, but for sure it involves change, yeah? Uh, well, this is a, a sentence that I like very much. Uh, culture, in the sense of organizational culture, eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, and, and this is a sentence that uh, it's supposed to be from Peter Drucker. This is a good guru for management. And what it means is that, well, you can write whatever you want in a paper of strategy. This is my strategy. But of course, then the problems arise when you really try to implement that strategy in your organization and you find all those people that are uh, blockers and that uh, makes it absolutely impossible. What you thought it was so easy, it, it's really not. And that's why you need to work uh, on, on that change management as, as well. Yeah. 
And finally, this capacity building, uh, it's the idea that, of course, people need to um, well, need to grow uh, in a personal and professional way, uh, of course. And if you want to enter a new field that's already in development and that you maybe have not worked before, then you need some training. And exactly, I think that's what we are doing here. And this training has not to be like a postgraduate course in a university, something very formal, but it needs to be just looking around, talking to people and looking to other sectors, looking to other countries, talking to peers and learning from each other um, and trying to well open your mind and trying to think how we could um, well implement or a, a strategy or design a strategy and implement it in our organization and start working in, uh, throughout this path that might be uh, well, not for one month or two months, but maybe uh, forever in the long run. Yeah. Ahead is a project funded by the European Union. Views and opinions expressed are however those of the authors only. Neither the European Union nor the granting authority can be held responsible for them. Don't forget to visit the AHEAD website and join the manifesto. Thank you.